Welcome to Helping Students at Risk in Large Classes. First of all, I want to congratulate you on being here. Uh, because you are here seeking to do this, it tells me that you are truly a professional, that even though you're teaching in large classes, you care about reaching each and every student. And um, that speaks very highly of your professionalisms, and I congratulate you. This is a little bit of a different format. I'm 8,000 miles away, but thank you for your patience as uh, you uh, attempt to let me participate in this seminar. We're going to try at the end of this session to have some questions and answers, but um, if anything goes wrong or you don't get to ask your questions, this is my email. Please feel free to ask me, uh, send me questions at any time or just share your own insights with me because you may have many things to contribute to me as well, and I love le learning from colleagues and sharing with you. Now, uh, we know that the large classrooms has many challenges for the instructor. For example, you don't have any time. There's uh, Everything takes so much time. Uh, there's so much record keeping. Uh, it's, assessment is hard, particularly formative assessment because uh, it is difficult to get to each student to just find out what they are learning. It is also uh, hard to get interaction going with all of your students and to know your students, which always makes teaching easier. For the students, there are challenges. For example, there, um, there is less monitoring by the instructor, so students have to be very self-directed. And of course, uh, that's hard for all students, but it's particularly hard for the at-risk student. There's also a sense of anonymity, which means um, nobody knows who you are. <laughs> and for the at-risk student, that can uh, be a way to escape and think that nobody cares who you are and what you're doing. There's also for students a sense of isolation. Where do I go for help? What do I do? Who do I collaborate with? And so um, it's very hard uh, for students not to feel alone. So, this is challenging for all students, but it's very challenging for at-risk students. At-risk students, I said, had no academic capital. What does that mean? That means they don't have any strategies, coping strategies stored up to use when things get tough. For example, when they're in a very large classroom. It's my little picture there on, is, is uh, imagine that your class is a boat and you're an island and it begins to sink. Students who already know how to swim have a problem, but they're probably going to be okay. When they get the difficulty, they have the capital to use to survive. But your students who don't know how to swim are probably going to be lost. That's your at-risk student. They don't have these academic abilities, this academic capital, to pull them out of the deep water when they get into the deep water of, uh, that has challenges for them. Also, because um, isolation is an issue, at-risk students frequently already feel isolated because of their academic lack of achievement. And so isolation hits them deeper and more seriously. Okay, I'm going to give you a group assignment in groups uh, of three to five. If you would divide yourself into groups of three to five, then I'm going to ask you um, to make a list of um, what do you think are the five top reasons your students do not experience success in your class. List five reasons that cause students to fail. Um, I'm going to give you three minutes to do that starting now.
I hope you're in your groups and working. Your time's about half gone. About a minute left now. Okay, let's uh, come back and talk together and see, does your list look something like this? Usually when I talk to people about at-risk students, these are the five things they come with. Students are at risk in my class because they don't participate, because they're absent, they don't turn in assignments or turn them in late, they have poor motivation, and they have poor test grades. Uh, maybe you have some of those on your list. But we're going to talk about those uh, five things, but we're going to talk about motivation very quickly. The reason is because it's huge, and we're on, we don't have time uh, to talk about just motivation. But just think, um, I want you to remember one thing about motivation. It's not really a reason why students are failing. It's not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. Uh, I use the analogy, what if I, uh, my car just stops? I don't say, oh, my car stops. Why? Because my car stopped. There's something wrong. It's out of gas. The engine's uh, uh, cracked. The, there's a, a fuel pumps out. Something caused the car to stop. A lack of motivation is like that. It's like um, the car stopping. And something is causing the students to seem unmotivated. So that's the only thing I'm going to say about motivation today is if you think a student is unmotivated, remember that that's just, that's just the way they act. Look deeper and see what the reason for that lack of motivation is. So let's focus on something we can do something about, the lack of participation. Why don't students participate? Mostly at-risk students fail to participate because of a lack of self-efficacy. They've experienced so much failure in academics that they don't even want to try. So uh, why does a lack of participation uh, cause a student to be at risk? You don't know what they don't understand. And the second one's very important. They're not processing the information. They're hearing you say it maybe even writing it down, but they're not processing it. They're not really interacting with you. So they're less likely to learn it and less likely to remember it. They also drift off um, and get a, increase their sense of isolation and be absent in mind, if not in body. So how do we increase their participation? Think about your questioning strategies. Now, even if you're lecturing, we tend to lecture in large classes, but even if you're lecturing, Stop and ask questions frequently. Have some way to track your questioning. Um, for example, the easiest way is a seating chart. A seating chart is very helpful for students in large classes because you can do lots of things with them. And one is to track your questioning. Just have a seating chart in front of you, and when you ask a question, just put a little mark on that student. Next question, put a mark on the student you're, you're asking. 
You can see your pattern that way of question asking. You need to make sure you're including all students, including those students at risk. The fronts in the back, the ones in the front, the ones that, that usually contribute, the ones that don't say anything. You want to include them all in your questioning. So uh, a seating chart is an easy way to do that. Another technique I use sometimes is the quadrant approach, where I say, the first part of this class, I'm going to only ask questions in that back fourth of the classroom, in that the right side, the back. And I will ask all my questions back there. The next uh, part of the class in this part. The next part in this quadrant. The next part of the class in this quadrant. So that I ensure that I'm covering the whole class with my questioning. That way you'll pull in those at-risk students that might not want to participate. Of course, avoid calling on the same person multiple times, even if that person knows all the answers. If they know the answers, they're really not the one you need to call on. You need to call on volunteers and non-volunteers because the ones who are not volunteering are you want to pull in. And the last thing is, especially for at-risk students, is to use plenty of wait time. Now, the research says that students need at least five seconds to come up with a good answer. That doesn't sound like much, but five seconds is a long time. For example, if I ask you now to answer a question, please. That's five seconds. That would give you time to think. And when students get used to knowing you're going to give them that time, they don't just say, oh, I don't know. They know that you're going to give them time to think and that you're going to wait for that answer. It will increase the participation in your class. Another way to increase uh, participation is to use group strategies. Now, you think, how am I going to use group strategies in this great big class? Um, you can do it, <laughs> uh, but you must include accountability. In other words, even uh, you must have some way that the groups know you're going to check to make sure they're doing what you ask them to do. It's easier in a very large group to set up the groups in advance. Uh, the first time, for example, the first time you use group work, it may take a little time to, to um, five or ten minutes, maybe, to help students understand how to get in groups. But after that, they can use the same groups each time for a, uh, several uh, class periods for even the whole semester if it's working. And that uh, when students get used to your working in groups, they do it very quickly, and it gets everyone to participate. For example, if I was going to ask a question, what was the most important scientific discovery of the 21st century? I guarantee you, very few students would want to answer that, and no at-risk students would, uh, because it takes some thought, and it's, it's a scary question. But what if I'd use a think-pair-share and said, okay, everybody think of who you, what you think was the most important scientific discovery. Now I want you to write that down on a piece of paper. Now I want you to turn to your a partner, someone sitting next to you, and exchange ideas. See what they think and, and tell them what you think. Talk about it for one minute. Now I'm going to call on different groups around the room to tell me what, they, uh, what their answer is, what that partnership has answered as far as. Now what that does, I think fair share is extremely powerful. It makes everyone participate. After you've used it a few times, they all know they better be talking about it because you might call on them. And it gives those at-risk students a sheltered place to try out their answer. Maybe, you know, maybe if a peer says it's not a silly answer, maybe it's not a silly answer and they'll be more willing to share it. Um, it's a very powerful technique to use. I, I use it often. Uh, you may want to, to let students work in small groups of, say, four to answer a question, four or five. Um, but if you do that, you want the accountability. And so what I suggest is you teach groups to, okay, we're going to do, I want you to talk about this question um, as a group. Now, I want you to write down, get a piece of paper, write down everyone's name in the group, and one sentence, one thought that they contributed or one question they ask and hand it in at the end of the, the group discussion. So that tells them they better be discussing it 
and everybody better be saying something. Now, what about you in all of your time? You've got this stack of papers. You just flip through them and identify the problem areas. You see a group that's having problems. They're the ones you want to monitor the next time. Or you may even want to say something to them about saying that you want better work from them. So um, this gives you a chance to see who's working out there, who's participating, and who is not. They would sign up with the group members. Uh, and one thing, one sentence that was contributed by each group member. Another way you can do it is to have multiple questions and have different groups consider different questions. For example, um, I set this up so that rows one through four, all of these groups, you're going to be talking about question one, and I will be picking groups to give me the answer. Um, all of this uh, section of the class is going to be considering section, all your groups are going to be talking about question two. All the groups in this part of the room are going to be talking about question three, and I will be calling on groups for answers. That gives a lot of discussion, and then when you start calling on answers, you've got answers for all three questions, and everyone participating. Um, in absenteeism, we're going to talk about absenteeism, you must take role in a large class. It's more important in a large class than in a small class because you must know who's absent. Uh, some quick ways to take row, um, electronic sign-ins. I know Q has the capability to use electronic signs, sign-ins with their ID cards. Uh, again, you can use a seating chart and just mark the empty chairs and write the names down after class. Uh, you can have a signature page. Now, if you do this, I suggest that the first class, or, or one of the very first class, you have students sign a, um, a list, and then you scan that. And your sign-in uh, sheet will be the list of signatures in a blank so that a student signs in right by their original signature. So you very quickly can see they can't sign in for somebody else because the signatures are, are side by side. And you can very quickly look down and see who is absent. Um, if you have problems with students coming late or leaving early, you may want to vary when you take row. So, uh, for example, if they're coming uh late, you want to take row at the first of class. If they're coming early and maybe leaving, coming at the first of class but slipping out, you may want to take row at the end. Um, use that variance of time to control what's happening in your class. Or you can have, uh, um, at the end of class, ask a question, have everybody write it down and hand you the piece of paper on the way out. Again, what you're looking for is what's not there, and you can do that pretty fairly quickly. Um, I'm going to come back to this. The reason absenteeism is so important is because students need to know you know they're absent. This will, uh, for every time a student is absent, it increases the probability that they will be absent again. It's a, an upward curve. Um, and if they're absent twice, they're in great danger of being absent a third time and, of course, failing the, the class if they're absent more than that. So, with every absence, um, the probability that they will be absent again increases and the probability that they will have difficulty in your class increases. So you need to do early intervention. Um, tell students how important attendance is. Let students know you know when they are absent. For example, send out a quick email that just says, I missed you in class. Uh, let me know if there is a problem that we need to talk about. All it says, it takes you five seconds. And even if you have 20 students absent, it only takes a few minutes out of your week. But it tells the students, I know you were absent, you were missed. The other thing is particularly important for at-risk students is, as instructors, we always feel like students, um, almost like we ought to punish them for being absent. Um, that's a sure way just to help them fail. We need to focus on student achievement and do everything we can to help them catch up. And one of the things, some of the things you can do is think in advance so that if one student is absent or 20 students are absent, they can use the same materials. Lecture capture is wonderful. Uh, having notes and external resources posted on the web is great. Um, any uh, opportunities that you can do to help them catch up 
will mean they will miss fewer classes in the future. It seems opposite, but if they get behind, they will start missing more and more because they can't catch up. Now, incomplete and late assignments, the reason is poor time management or low self-efficacy. They know they're not going to do well, and so they just put off starting. Um, so helping students feel like they can achieve is a way of, of increasing that. Even in, sm in large classes, you can do many checks before an assignment is due. For example, um, say a big project's due, say bring in uh, a, a short description of what you've done so far. We're going to check it on Thursday. And then just have them put it on the desk and walk down the rows and just check off who's done it and who's making progress and who hasn't. All that does is give them a little push and helps them get those assignments done and get them in on time. You can also do peer check where they exchange uh, papers in class and see how much each other has done and report that to you. Again, that just gives you a way to encourage the ones who are falling behind to keep going forward. Okay, the most important thing uh, is to ask yourself why students wouldn't make the effort to come to your class and to get the assignments in. Sometimes we can change that by just making things a little more exciting. Okay, second group assignment. You have three minutes. Talk with your partner and um, just a partner, just pair up this time and talk about how you currently take role and how you currently encourage students to participate. And then talk about what new strategies you might try. You may, uh, together, have some strategies you use that I haven't mentioned. Share those with each other during this three minutes. Thank you.